Hello and welcome to The Shift, the podcast that aims to tell the no-holds-barred truth about being a woman post-40. Created and hosted by me, journalist and author, Sam Baker. Would you credit it? There's an award-winning novelist in my box room. Maggie O'Farrell is the author of eight novels, most recently the stunning women's prize winner Hamnet, and one of my favourite memoirs of all time, I Am, I Am, I Am. And now she's written a children's book, Where Snow Angels Go, which is a banker for a Christmas Day tea time animation in the style of the snowman, if ever I saw one. I've always found it quite hard to find, you know, stories that build resilience, stories that challenge you for that age group. So I thought, okay, well, maybe I'll just try and write one. While Maggie noses through my bookcase and plays with Sausage the Cat, we talk being a social media refusenik, giving voice to women's stories, saying good riddance to the male gaze, why she never thought she was the marrying kind, and why she still secretly thinks someone might take away her women's prize. I'm in my box room <laughs> with Maggie O'Farrell. Maggie, welcome to the box room. It's a really nice box room. I wouldn't describe it as a box room at all. <laughs> it's got windows. It has, lots of windows, loads of books, nice rug, it's lovely. When we moved up here, the other house that we were bidding on that we didn't get, uh-huh. it would have really, really been a box room. It was literally, yes. it was only good for recording podcasts and nothing else. <laughs> the podcast room. Rename yeah, it. it would have literally been a podcast room. <laughs> Anyway, Maggie, congratulations on winning the Women's Prize. Thank you very much. It still hasn't quite sunk in, but yeah, it's you know, it's lovely. It's a really nice thing. Did you think it was possible? No, really didn't, actually. I mean, I was so... I don't know, being on the shortlist seemed, you know, so thrilling. And it was an amazing shortlist this year. Mm, really, really. Brilliant shortlist. So many, you know, fantastic novels and also... Ones that I had never come across before, so I'd never read Angie Cruz, that Dominicana, and you know, which I absolutely loved. I was really blown away by it because I'm a big fan of Juna Diaz, yeah. um, who writes so brilliantly about the Dominican Republic. But then to get this kind of female perspective in um, Dominicana was so intriguing. And I absolutely, I'm a huge fan of Jenny Offill, and I love mm. Department of Speculation. I think I've read it three times, so I was thrilled. So it just felt like this amazing kind of gang that I was in it was one of my big joys of lockdown actually rereading you know the Mantel and the Evaristo and then you know reading these new books that I hadn't come across and Ashley Haynes and uh, and Jenny Offal and, and <laughs> so but it seemed like enough actually to be on the shortlist that felt like enough of a gift really so now I was actually totally totally shocked I never at a very kind of deep cellular level I really yeah. never expected it at all so uh, yeah it hasn't quite sunk in and as I was saying to you earlier that the kind of set up this year, the sort of digital Zoom calls, it does sort of feed into the paranoia that it might all be a bit of a prank somehow. Yeah, <laughs> imposter syndrome. You've just won the Women's Prize and you've still got imposter syndrome. <laughs> yeah. I do have the Bessie statue now on my windowsill and that. Every time I feel the imposter syndrome, I have a look at her and she's very, she's very beautiful. Do you suffer from imposter syndrome as a role? Well, it's funny. I don't know if I would call it that, but I think yeah, possibly actually. I do remember being at university and thinking for the first, probably the first two or three terms, somebody's going to come and knock on my door and say, actually, sorry, it's been a mistake. You really have to go. You know, you didn't really think you could come here, did you? <laughs> So I think possibly, but actually I think I think things like the Women's Prize, it's so, you know, it's such a once in a lifetime astonishing thing to happen to you. And I think you, you have to kind of enjoy it. You've got to feel it and you've got to enjoy it for maybe a couple of days, maybe a week. And then you have to kind of put it away. You've just got to keep on making good work. I think it's part, you know, I never read my reviews. That's another, that's another sort of Don't part you? of the same thing. Yeah, I really avoid it, even if they're, even if they're really nice. <laughs> so mm. my husband... He provides a really good service. He reads them and he says it was really bad. It was pretty good. It was all right, or it was it was a really good one. I never read them just because I think it's bad for you to bad for you to see yourself from the outside. In a sense, if you're trying to write, you know, you need to mm. write to write the kind of story that you can't not write, the book that you can't not write, and that's always going to be your best book. You know, I think if you're trying to second guess what people might want or a reader might want, I think it's bad to to sort of feel yourself explain to yourself to have that self-consciousness mm. about you if you read a review there might be one line you know that her concerns are this or her you know her novel is about this or the themes that she mm. <laughs> writes about you're going to hear that in the back of your head when you're writing and you don't I think you don't need to hear it you need to write in a bubble or I do anyway is that one of the reasons you stay off social media it's quite complicated because I think it's a lot of it's to do with time you know I have to I really need to write many different ways and I also have three kids and you know life is busy 
and the internet and social media is very chronophagic. It is going to suck you in. Um, I've never heard that word before, but I like it. <laughs> it's a good word, isn't it? Yeah. Good word. Chronophagic um, or chronophagic? Phagic. Steals phagic. your time. Yeah, chronophagic. Yeah. You know, I sort of, I mean, I do have a smartphone now. I've had one for, I think, two years now. And I sort of hate it. <laughs> you know, I think, I think we all have to, we have to ask ourselves questions about it. We have to ask ourselves why we need it and why we are constantly, you know, reaching for it. Do we want it to alter our behaviour? Do we want it to alter our relationships with other people? You know, we have to always remember that these apps and, you know, software are designed by really clever people who mm. are setting out to exploit the weaknesses in human psychology. <laughs> I, I would never say to someone, don't use it, and I wouldn't look down on anybody for using it. But I think we have to ask questions about it and ask ourselves questions about our relationship with it. It seems to me like all of it is about you avoiding ex internal influence <laughs> on your decisions or your possibly yeah which I, I really admire I mean I wouldn't say influence because obviously I'm hugely influenced by people around me and the books I read and the films I watch and the music I listen to and mm. I think you have to pick your influences I think don't you yeah yeah I mean obviously you know I, I use the internet and there's a lot on it which I find incredibly useful you know it's incredibly useful in articles that I read and I suppose what I feel for myself is that I have to be I have to be careful and I have to be choosy because I know it's addictive you know, there's no coincidence mm, really that is, yeah. people are called users. The only, there's only other one other department of life, yeah. or section of life, where people are described as users, and that's drugs and alcohol, isn't it? That's so true. It I never thought of it like that. So I think, yeah, <laughs> I mean, it is addictive. You know, I see it in my children. I worry about my this generation because they have no immunity to the kind of siren song of the internet and you know oh, they're media. born to it weren't they you know when you're young i think especially teenagers they have no sense of how to regulate themselves with it and i find that very concerning for our children hopefully the best way you can give you is give your kids a good example if they see you with your phone and your tablet in your hand then they're going to want one too aren't they so do they see will with his phone and you without and then they have to choose <laughs> so. i guess so <laughs> <laughs> Were you always so self-contained? No, seriously. Okay, so from outside, the listeners, Maggie's looking horrified that I just said that. Um, <laughs> They're not horrified, just a bit laughing. That's well, not how I think of myself. From outside, you seem very self-contained, but from inside, you're like, what? <laughs> I don't think, well, it's not really, no, I've never thought of myself like that. I think I've always been quite independent. I think when you're a child, you're described as headstrong, aren't you? Yes, yeah. difficult. Yeah, I suppose, I know I still, there's all kinds of words you could use for it, aren't you? But I suppose I've always been quite independent. I always knew I wanted kids, but I remember saying this to Will that I was really surprised. I never really imagined that I'd be married <laughs> or yeah. in that kind of relation, a sort of married relationship. I never pictured that as a future for me. I knew that I would have love affairs. I knew I'd have men coming in and out of my life, but I never thought I would be yeah. <laughs> settled in a kind of, you know, um, codependent relationship as I have been for 20 years now. So that's... that's. And how did Will feel about that? <laughs> <laughs> I think he's quite used to, He knows me quite well. Yeah. <laughs> and he said, oh, well, bad luck. <laughs> there you so, are. Yeah, exactly. I mean, there is so much to talk about with Hamlet, and you've talked about most of it already, anyway, motherhood and grief and all that. But one of the things that I love most about it is the way that you reclaim mm-hmm. Alice. Is that how you well, I, I mean, it? I actually call it Agnes in myself just because it's. It's, uh, it's quite tricky. I think in those it would have been pronounced Anis or An- mm-hmm. Anya. It's a bit like the French, but... It's when I was reading it, I kept trying to pronounce it in my head and couldn't work it out. But I the know, way when I was writing you... it, I just, yeah, I just always referred to her internally as Agnes. Yeah, it was just easier. The kind of reclamation, if you like, of her story, her narrative, mm. and the re- her rehabilitation. Did you intend to rehabilitate her? No, I didn't think of it in those terms but I think I just wanted to give her a narrative of her own actually I feel she's somebody you know I mean Shakespeare himself is such a he's such a mysterious figure you know we have all this output of his work but actually he left a really really scant paper trail for himself you know he didn't even make sure that his plays were published before he died and he could have done he had quite a long retirement and back in Stratford upon Avon I don't know what else he was doing but that fascinates me about him but there's not a huge amount of documentation about him the person he was and what he was doing and there's massive gaps in his story but at the same time if you you know if we think there's not much about him we know almost nothing about her nothing at all you know we don't even have a record of her birth because she was born before parish records began we know that she got married and we know she had three children and we know when she died and that's pretty much it really but this lack of information hasn't stopped historians and scholars and biographers and screenplay writers and other novelists from rushing forward to fill this sort of void with just hatred actually and Mm. vilification and misogyny and we've always been fed this narrative about her 
that she's this kind of ageing peasant strumpet who tricked this genius into marriage. <laughs> he hated her and he had to run away to London to get away from her and <laughs> he regretted this marriage. You know, and they base it on pretty much nothing. They constantly will evoke, you know, the famous second best bed behest in his will. But, you know, if you actually look at, you know, an image of his will, that second best bed is an interlineation. So it's squeezed in between two other lines. And the will itself is a really dry document, you know. I mean, it doesn't seem to have been written in the voice of somebody who has possibly written the greatest love poetry and scenes ever. And yes, there's no affection really showed for his wife in the will, but there's no affection shown for anybody else, actually. I mean, it's... It was a will, though. It's a will. Yeah, he was dying. I mean, <laughs> he was very clearly... I mean, possibly a typhoid. So, I mean, you know, there's no nice death, but typhoid is particularly not a nice death. And I just got so frustrated by this and so, I don't know, revolted by all this kind of hatred for her that I just, I just decided that I wanted to tell a new story. And so one of the things I was looking at, I was looking at the document of her father's will. So he died, Richard Hathaway died a year before she married William. And in it, he leaves her a very generous dowry and he refers to her as my daughter Agnes. And I thought, <laughs> you know, what on earth is that? You know, have mm. we been calling her by the wrong name on top of everything else for almost half a century? And surely if anyone knows her real name, it's her father. going to be her father. <laughs> yeah. So that was a real kind of gift in a sense but it was a real kind of lightning bolt moment where I thought you know maybe she is she's nothing like the person that she's always represented as there's one tiny shred of documentation that shows that she was she ran a really successful malting business later in life so I don't know none of it feeds into this idea that she is this woman Mm. (laughs) sitting pining bitterly (laughs) back in Stratford when William Shakespeare retired I mean he was the equivalent of a multi-millionaire you know he was an incredibly successful businessman as well as being a pretty good playwright you know <laughs> good enough <laughs> he, yeah. you know he he chose to live in really modest lodgings in London and he sent all his money back to Stratford so in Stratford he bought I mean he bought his wife and daughters an enormous mansion of a house the year after Hamlet died huge place and he also bought fields and cottages and he leased them out so he was obviously a very successful landlord in Stratford I often wonder if that's how he was seen at the time just as a landlord <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> but also at the end of his career I mean he could have chosen to live anywhere but he chose to go back to Stratford and to live with his wife which again doesn't speak of somebody who hated his wife and regretted his marriage does it? No I mean if he hated her wouldn't he have got a nice house in London and He could have done that there. easily set himself up had a whole other life I mean I know you have to be very careful not to read too much into the, of his life in the plays and vice mm. versa but there are so many instances of very constant faithful devoted wives intelligent wives as well there's a whole lot made about her being illiterate was she illiterate and how terrible it is that he married this illiterate woman which is so it's it's just missing the point because of course she probably was illiterate but you know what kind of daughter of a sheep farmer would have been taught to read in the 16th century you know it's, it's obvious to me that illiteracy doesn't necessarily mean stupidity does it there's so much in keeping though isn't it with the way that women are have been written about and spoken mm. about if they're spoken about at all you know men mm. are geniuses and the women are at best a muse <laughs> yeah exactly sidelined or just having there. having the babies of the genius yeah yeah and the story kind of and that's one of the things that interests me in my book is that the way the story stops even now at motherhood yes it's true for actually. women what amazes me are that on that subject actually about the whole Shakespeare story I mean there's obviously a reason why his biographers and scholarship focuses on his career in London you know and his domestic family life back in Stratford has been sort of elided over. But about the time, so both his daughters, Judith and Susanna, both lived really long time. You know, Judith was actually in her early 70s when she died, which wow, is really? astonishing. Yeah, and of course that was about the time that Shakespeare's reputation was re-emerging and people were starting to write biographies of him and to put on his plays again. But not one of the people ever thought to go to Stratford to ask his daughters about him. Which would not have been the case if he'd had a son. <laughs> and you think... But what has been lost from that? You know, if any of them had decided just to take a trip to Stratford where his daughters were living, you know, they were married and they had their own children, but nobody did. So that incredible cash and possibility of knowledge about him as a man has gone forever. It's really insane when you think about it, isn't it? Yeah, it's terrible. It's like just that short distance away yeah. <laughs> were people who could have told you everything, everything yeah. about him everything about him and think what we would have we would know today about him which we don't know because of that I mean you do always write women's stories is that is that intentional well not really I mean you know 
Hamlet's a boy. Yeah. <laughs> As if like that. Yeah, but the women are very much front and centre, aren't they? I suppose yeah. so. I mean, I suppose with this book, I wasn't, I didn't certainly set out to write a women's story. I mean, and Shakespeare himself, he's a more sort of marginalised character in this, but that's because he is who he is and he wasn't there. You know, he was in London working for a lot of the time. I'm sure he did come back. But, you know, and I think I've always felt that Hamlet, the boy, has been completely overlooked. He isn't well known enough. You know, and I think nobody has ever really given the significance he deserves. You know, the fact that without him or without him dying, we wouldn't wouldn't have the play Hamlet. We probably wouldn't have Twelfth Night, you know, which is about boy and girl twins who are separated and they each think the other is dead and then they're magically reunited at the end. I know, but then having now just finished Hamlet again, just like... (laughs) I know. The really amazing thing, I remember I was looking at a playbill for Twelfth Night and I realised that the opening night at the Globe Theatre was on what would have been a twin's birthday. How interesting. Yeah. And of course Shakespeare himself, I'm sure, would have chosen that date. That's really interesting. Yeah, it's heartbreaking. As a bit of a, like, Maggie Bore, I've been looking at the way that your works kind of run and how it's really interesting to me that you wrote Hamnet after you wrote the memoir. <laughs> Do you think you could have written Hamlet if you hadn't written quite an exposing memoir? I don't know. I mean, it's funny. I certainly wanted to write Hamlet for quite a while. And I did have I did have a couple of shots at it. I think actually I've written three books instead of, <laughs> instead yeah. of writing Hamlet. I kind of swerved away from it. And I did do a bit more research and I thought about it. And I did actually start writing. So I did have, I don't know, I remember sort of giving myself a talking to and think, saying, you know, you've either, you've either just got to do it or you've just got to forget about it. You know, you can't keep circling around. You can't have these ever-growing line of books on your shelf mm-hmm. <laughs> Shakespeare and life in the 16th century you know you just got to do it or forget about it you know now or never and so I did have a look at the document and I'd written about 20,000 words and I read it and I realised it was all wrong <laughs> and I started it in the wrong the wrong sort of you know if you imagine the, one of the first decisions you've got to make with a story is that you know if you imagine your kind of novel as a chronological line you've got to decide at what point you're going to jump in you know do you jump near the end and then come back to the mm-hmm. beginning or do you start in the beginning and work chronologically and all that stuff and I'd started totally at the wrong place so I just kind of ditched that and started again and but I don't know I mean it's funny I think all in a sense all your books all the books that you write are sort of reactions to their predecessor possibly but again it's one it's one of those things that I don't ever analyse too much I don't I try not to think about it actually because I think if you try and plot your your working there's a kind of line I'm sure there is but I wouldn't I avoid thinking about it it's the kind of thing you get from students and annoying interviewers who say uh, <laughs> no, yes, about the importance of the ferocity of motherhood in the works of Maggie O'Farrell, isn't it? It's like... <laughs> Possibly. No, not knowing. I think it's just, I suppose it goes back to what I was saying, you've always got to write the book. You can't not write the one that's sort of knocking on the door insistently saying, pay attention to me now. And so children's book next. Where yeah. did that come from? Yeah, that was a bit from left field. Well, actually, it was from, I sort of made up a story for my own kids. And it was one that I told them sort of verbally. And then I did go on... It was when I was on a book tour. I can't remember what... It was either for the memoir or the one before. It might have been for that. I can't remember exactly. And I was writing them a letter a day because I was away for quite a while. So I wrote a letter and I put it in the post box every day so they would get something through, through, the, through the door. And so I was writing them the story about snow angels uh, every bit a day. And when I got back home, my youngest said to me, she was actually falling off to sleep. She said, well, you read the whole thing to me start to finish. And so I did. And then she said, I really want to see pictures for this. I really want to see the pictures. It needs to be a proper book that I can, I can hold in my hands. Oh. <laughs> I it was so sweet. And I walked away and I was thinking, well, maybe it could be. Maybe it could. I don't, I mean, the thing is, I'd never, <laughs> ever written for children at all. Just because you've written, you know, however many novels, it doesn't mean you can just do that. It doesn't mean you can change course. You know, it's a really specific skill of writing for children and it's not something you can just pick up and it's not a hobby. (laughs) It's very, very particular. So I didn't know if it was possible. And actually the other other thing, my other daughter was one standing behind me one day and I was, I think I had a bit of Hamlet up on screen. I don't know what I was doing. I was either writing it or editing at all. And she was reading it over my shoulder and she just said, she said, I don't like this book. It's too sad. She said, you've got to write something happy next time. Oh, how old is she? <laughs> At the time, she was probably 10, I think. Traumatised. <laughs> no, the... but she wasn't reading any of the really terrible, <laughs> really, really grim scenes, but it was, it was obviously sad, no, I can't remember which, but it was. But So I said to her, OK, I'll write something happy. So that's why I decided to write Snow Angels. It's absolutely lovely. best children's books actually don't talk to children like they're children yes 
And I, I think, firmly believe that. Well, Snow Angels is simple. It's not simplistic. Well, you say, I always think about Beatrix Potter, who, whom I absolutely love, actually. She's very synonymous for some people with this kind of English pretty landscape and stories about bunnies. But actually, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, anyone who's read her properly, um, she's terrifying. It's absolutely terrifying. And they're very deep, frightening stories that grapple with enormous themes of mortality and evil, good versus evil. And So, I, yeah, I think she's fantastic. But she is somebody who uses, I mean, the Flopsy Bunnies, I think, where she describes le- lettuce as having a soporific effect. I mean, that's <laughs> an astonishing phrase, yeah. astonishing vocabulary to use in a children's book. But I read that as a child, and I don't, I don't know. I think, I think children, if they don't necessarily understand it, they'll either skim over it. And they will also, you come see the picture of the bunny going to sleep. That's right. I mean, it's amazing chutzpah, really, to put that in yeah. the children's book. But brilliant, brilliant chutzpah. Yeah, well, I think you might have another winner. <laughs> I can see it in the Christmas Christmas Day tea time animation slot, for sure. <laughs> well, I was quite interested because I wanted to write a story about winter, in a sense, that's ecumenical. So I'm from, you know, a kind of quite traditional Christian religious background, and my husband's Jewish, and so... It's tricky, I've always found, to find books that do just talk about seasonal and winter and aren't particularly related to a religious festival like that. So I wanted to write something that was sort of a, sort of slightly referring to it, but certainly not adhering to any kind of particular religious principle. But I think winter is, I don't know, winter's a fascinating thing. I mean, certainly in folklore, winter's a very dangerous time. You know, it used to be dangerous. I mean, it still mm. is, actually, mm. <laughs> particularly this year, I think. You know, it's a time when your life could be in threat and your survival was under threat at certain places. Um, so I was interested in that idea. But also, I think, you know, what really drove, made me want to write it is that I found that there is... You know, it's strange. There are so many picture books for sort of the under fives, in a sense, or under sixes, which grapple with huge themes. I mean, like the Beatrix Potter or like the John Classen's book, I Want My Hat Back, mm-hmm. or The Tiger Who came to tea you know they're dark and they're strange and they you can read them on one level but there's a whole other levels underneath that you can yeah. really see I mean I still remember reading I want my hat back with my two or three year old on my knee <laughs> and we turned the last page and I remember looking at her thinking does she realize what's happened <laughs> and she had a really long look at the last picture and she said did he eat the rabbit yeah. <laughs> that kind of, just the shock on her face yeah, which but you... also the slight glee because the rabbit stole his hat you know did the rabbit deserve it? you know it's massive yeah. questions huge questions fascinating but then the weird thing happens I think until you sort of reach you know I don't know what age you'd need to be maybe 10 or 11 and you get to maybe the Lemony Snickets and the Harry Potters and Narnia and there's a kind of weird sort of drop off in books that are about challenging themes. I understand it because, I mean, I'm not saying there are none, but there are, there is a weird sort of dearth in a strange way. And obviously it's probably around the age where children are going off and reading on their own and you don't want, (laughs) perhaps you don't want children to be, you know, dealing with these things on their own. But I've always found it quite hard to find, you know, stories that build resilience, stories that challenge you for that age group. So I thought, okay, well, I'll Maybe I'll just try and write one. And you've done it. Well, I'm so lucky because I was paired with just uh, this absolutely brilliant illustrator, Daniela Joglinka Terrazzini. And she was absolutely my dream. The pictures are beautiful. <laughs> they are they amazing, are beautiful. aren't they? So my lockdown was illuminated once a fortnight with these things appearing in my inbox. Oh, <laughs> wow. Inbox, these images. Yeah. And they're just so absolutely perfect and she and I had quite long discussions back and forth about angels and what they looked like and what our favourite angels were I went to Rome last year and I was walking along the Ponte San Angelo and there were these incredible sculptures of angels some are by Benini and other sculptures so I was taking all these pictures and emailing them to Danielle I was saying look look at these look at these <laughs> these are the Ur angel so she, no, she's done an absolutely incredible job. So it's the first time I've ever collaborated with anybody, which has been such a joy, actually, such a brilliant experience. Could you imagine collaborating again? I would love to. I'd love to, as long as... To, I think Daniela's probably a very busy woman, though. But no, I'd love to do another book with Daniela, if, if that's possible. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised. It's a, the podcast called The Shift. Hmm. What have been the big shifts in your life, the moments where there's been, like, a sea change? God, so many. I mean, certainly leaving home, I think, is the biggest one. I think illness is a huge shift. I think that's a kind of experience. You know, anybody who's been through any kind of severe illness will know that you go through it. It's a bit like walking through fire. You're sort of melted down in a sense and you, you have to make yourself a new on the other side. You're the same elements and same atoms, but in a totally different shape, in a way. Giving up my day job, I remember that being a big thing because I used to be a journalist. I remember giving up my kind of office day job at the independent and deciding to be I mean it's not that I ever thought I'm going to become now I'm going to be a writer I just decided to go freelance and do a bit of writing on the side because I wrote my first 
two books when I was still working full time. I don't know, and having children, that's an enormous shift, I think, because your life is unrecognisable to you. The, you know, the minute your mm. first child takes, in my case, his first breath, you know, life as you know it is gone, it's over. And that something else has completely taken its place. I think certainly coming into what's called middle age, which is not a phrase I particularly like, but I think that's a big shift. Mm. And your children needing you less is a... You know, because I've got quite a big age gap in my kids. My eldest is 17 and my youngest is eight. I'm really lucky, actually, having had a long period with quite young kids in the house. You know, obviously an eight-year-old is a bit more... I mean, they still need you, obviously, but they're much less, they're much less with you all the time, actually. So that's been a huge shift. But I think life is constantly... I don't know, I love... One of my favourite books is Pride Said Revisited, and Evelyn War says in it that change is the only sign of life. Mm. I'm a terribly restless person, so I kind of like change. I really need change. Mm. If I get bored, I like to kind of move the furniture around, or I like to, you know, mm. I need to constantly. That's why I, I like to wear different clothes every day. Do you oh. hate my clothes? They're literally <laughs> the same thing over and over. Yeah, but everyone, you know, it obviously fulfills a need in you, I think. My husband wears the same clothes every day. He just, that's the way, that's what makes him happy. But, I, you know, I think all of us a different sort of made up differently in that sense but I need I really need a lot of novelty I like things to change and I absolutely love my house I would never really want to move but I do always think well if I lived here I came to your house and I thought well I could live here I think I always I sort of like shifts I like changes do you think that change is built into women just like literally biologically I suppose it is I mean it's certainly it's very interesting having I mean watching my son go through adolescence and I mean I, know, I mean, I hate to generalise in this way about gender, certainly, but it's mm. always seemed like a lot less of a big deal, I think it is, than I think it is for girls. I remember thinking, look, watching him when he was maybe, I don't know, 13 or 14, and I thought, he's never, ever, ever going to have to get used to walking onto a bus and people staring at his body or people mm. commenting on him or people, you know, and how extraordinary that would be. Imagine, you know... And I was I remember looking, I remember the first time it started happening to me and I was probably 11 or 12 and I look at my 11 or 12 year olds and I think, Jesus, they're children, you know, mm. what a moment for that to happen and how horrifying that is. I remember being really frightened suddenly when you realise that the, your, your physical appearance is causing all this attention and all this unwanted attention and all these comments and looks and very frightening, really frightening for young, I mean, they're, you know, they're children children i was on a, a tube a few years ago and there was two quite young sort of blokes in their 20s and they were very drunk and they started hassling this child i mean she was probably 13 very beautiful girl but i remember her mother was saying to her please leave her alone she's 13 please please oh god her mother stop. was there and she yes was, they were still hassling and they were hassling her, her and it was just so awful and i remember coming home and looking at my daughters and thinking oh my god that's only three years away four years away and just feeling this kind of horror thinking oh god how can it be you know how can it be ahead of them but you know I suppose you know we all adjust to it and we all learn how to deal with it but it's not a nice end of childhood is it and I do think boys don't necessarily have that perhaps different but it's different yeah I mean I'm not saying there are no pressures on young males because of course there are mm. there will be a facetious thing to say but different pressure one of the things that's really struck me nearly everybody i've spoken to has said that they in no way miss the kind of male gaze shifting away from them <laughs> no such a relief isn't it <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah it is yeah i would there's nothing nothing about that that i think oh wouldn't it still be nice if no there isn't it's such a relief <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah I mean, yeah, it's very good to be off that radar. <laughs> <laughs> when I was thinking earlier about questions and thinking about your social media and stuff, and you're kind of, are you 48 now? Yes. And yeah. you're, aside from the fact that you've just won this enormous prize, which may actually make you much more visible, <laughs> you're at the point when, you know, men do become like into their prime and visible and women tend to just like just nip over there mm. and do something and don't bother us. Um, do you think you would regard the invisibility as a kind of a gift or a problem? I mean, it's funny. I don't think of women of that age as invisible at all. And I've heard other people say that, but I find it completely untrue. I mean, you think about Bernadine Evaristo, what's she, 60? Yes, yeah, she's 60. 61? 60? Mm, 60, yeah. And Hilary Mantel, who's, mm. what, in her 70s? Yeah, I'm not sure, yeah. Judy Dench or... I don't know, Kate Blanchett, are they invisible? No, they're not. <laughs> you know, there no. are women at the, in all kinds of fields who are at the, I don't like the phrase at the top of their game, but you know, yeah, <laughs> they are yeah. just, yeah, just f flying high. I don't, I mean, perhaps what they mean is that kind of cessation of being sexualised, but to me that doesn't feel like invisibility. No, that's a good thing. Yeah, it's a good well, thing. Depends on your perspective, but for me it's a good thing. It depends if that's the kind of 
thing that powers your batteries, and it certainly has no, it's no. never been I suspect probably not yours, <laughs> or Bernie Debris, or whatever you might tell, you know. And I think if, if that is the kind of thing which has powered your batteries, then just find a different way to recharge. You know? <laughs> because of course you're not. I mean, there's so much, I don't know, I find it quite exciting. I just, you know, and I, I think that's partly why I really hate the, I mean, I don't really like the phrase middle age, but actually, I don't like its sort of negative pejorative connotations because it seems to me that if it is your middle age if we are if you and I Sam are in the middle of our life then god we're really lucky yeah we've got a really long time to go we've got another half to go and half it yes exactly quick let's touch it if it it is if we are at our midpoint then we're one of the lucky ones because there are so many who aren't and so many who are still not with us and I don't know, it's, I find it a fascinating thing and it doesn't it doesn't give me any problem at all. And I know that for my husband is actually really deeply bothered about about to be turning fifty. Oh is he? Yeah, which I find That's really interesting. strange, isn't it? Really strange. And he finds it really bothers him that he can't play football anymore. Or I mean it's probably because he was sporty, I never I never yeah, was, I no. never would be. But I, and he finds the kind of physical signs of ageing. Mm really really get to him probably i mean you know it is annoying i hate having to go and see a chiropractor on my back and yeah and creaking when you get creaking up, yeah. I have an operation on my shoulder you know and all i mean but it's just i mean god it's better than the alternative isn't it because what is the alternative exactly. it's, it's not being here at all and so many people aren't and i think you've got to you've got to feel how lucky you are to have gray hairs and to be getting older and you know and i heard someone recently one of my friends was complaining about how her breasts look and, I, and, I, and then another friend of mine said, well, at least you've still got your breasts, because I haven't. <laughs> and oh, I thought... Oh, God. But then she said it in a very... I mean, it wasn't aggressive, but I thought, well, too right, actually. Yeah, that too puts right. it in perspective. Yeah, exactly. Make the most of them, even if they're not what they were. Mm. I mean, <laughs> yeah. just be glad that they are yeah. still there. Yeah, it's the kind of... It's the framing, isn't it, of ageing as about being about what you're losing, not what you're gaining. Yeah, I mean, ageing is a, is a very loaded word as well. I just think of it as just we're still living yeah and thank god for that you know long may it last before i get to the kind of like the questions i always ask i'm gonna <laughs> ask you a question about language and the way language is applied to older women when it is applied to older women at, at the most basic level you've kind of got the silver fox although not will because he's not feeling very happy about it <laughs> um and you know women the language is all very negative i was interviewing a french woman and she said that the equivalent of old bag in french is old skin literally old skin (laughs) and and it's still only applied to To women women, yes even though presumably men's skin is the same age (laughs) yeah and i just think when you start looking at the language that's used around women who are older the language is all you know crone and mm. old this and it's ridiculous, old that. Isn't it? I don't know. I just wondered. Got any ideas? <laughs> well, language. I mean, I think it. You know, language in a sense is is sort of out of our control, but also in our control. It depends whether we want to use it and whether we recognise it. You know, I mean, I think of the word crone, and I think that's an awful word, and I would never use it for anyone. The other day, when my somebody was asking about the word spinster, which is a terrible word, isn't it? I mean. And there's no male equivalent, obviously, because bachelor is equivalent, but that sounds quite racy, doesn't it? And, but actually, the sort of etymology of spinster is a woman who had no choice about how to make her living than to take in spinning. And so she probably was unmarried, but she could have been, you know, she husband could have died or she, you know, there could be any kind of situation. But that's what it literally means, a woman who works for herself <laughs> in yeah. the only way that she can and earns money and isn't dependent on anyone. So and in that really, sense, it's a perfectly decent word. Yeah, it's perfectly decent. It's very, it's very respectable. And why not? Why shouldn't you? You know, maybe if you don't want to go and live with relatives or, you know, mm. become, a, become a drudge or become a maid of all work, maybe, it's, you know, being a spinster was, was a good option for you. Yeah, it's really interesting when you look at it like that. Yeah. It's like, if you look back to the things that denoted a witch. Oh, God, you know, yes. They were all things that just basically denoted a middle-aged woman, probably menopausal. Yeah. Possibly, yeah, no. exactly. A very wise woman I know who was talking, we were talking about, we were discussing the menopause and she said, she's a bit older than me and I, I really like her and I always take her advice and she said, you've got to think about the menopause as, as an advantage so because it, what happens to you when you're in your kind of fertile years is you're completely cyclical and your mind is going round and you're on this kind of cyclical treadmill from month to month. And she said, when you leave that, she said, you can start to think in this exciting linear way, you can look far forward into the future she said you can achieve all kinds of things. She said you just get down off the cyclical treadmill. I think she's really right. 
she I sounds great. Brilliant. She is amazing. Yeah. <laughs> she probably would have been uh, termed a witch. <laughs> yeah, probably. <laughs> a long time ago. <laughs> well, it's like the um, the brilliant Fleabag quote, you know, the Kristen Scott Thomas quote, where she says about basically how the menopause is shit and then it's wonderful because you're no longer tied to the biological cycles. Yes. Oh, okay, yes. And I think there's real, there's a lot in it. It's the best scene. It's probably <laughs> still the only scene I've seen where a woman of that age has been portrayed as interesting and beautiful. hot and beautiful yeah. and smart yeah. and yeah. definite. Actually. Yes, exactly. Happy in her skin. Yeah. Not old skin, beautiful skin. Yeah, not old skin. Got on this. <laughs> yeah, just skin. <laughs> what would be your emotional age? I don't know, probably ageless actually. I don't really think about age. Age oh, isn't really that important to me. It's funny, I heard someone say, oh, I really like this person. She said, but I'm much too old to be friends with her. And I thought, what? I mean, that's never never occurred to me. There's a brilliant bit in <laughs> Edward St. Obin's book, Mud's Milk, where the father is trying to encourage his son to have more friends his own age. And the son turns around to him and says, well, are all your friends 45? <laughs> Which I think is so brilliant. And I always think of that. And I think it would be so weird if all my friends were 47 or 48. <laughs> Yeah. I have one friend who, it, she, as a joke, she says she still thinks about school years. And she said, oh, well, you, she often says to me, but you, but you would have been in a year above me. Yeah. <laughs> Which I find so funny at this stage in our lives. I don't know. I think in some ways I feel like very childish and in some ways I feel very old. I feel like one of those matryoshkas with all those cells are all just inside you and you can take them out sometimes and sometimes you put them back and you can... Adapt. Maybe that's part of being a writer in a way. I really like that image, though. So. Well, Troisca dolls are fantastic. I love them. I'm slightly obsessed with them. They're brilliant. <laughs> yeah. What is the book that you would force on people if you could recommend one book? It's really hard. I mean, the book I I probably have read most, reread most in my whole life is Jane Eyre, which I still really love, and I read it about once every two years or so. But I also, I also gave my son recently... The Outsider by Albert Camus, which I really think is wonderful. It's an incredible stylistic achievement and also just getting under the skin of a character who's as strange and distant as that. But, oh, I don't know, so many. I really love the Canterbury Tales. <laughs> I think if I, was, if I was about to be stranded on a desert island, I would take that. I think I would miss the people's voices and conversation so much that I would... Would that be your desert island book? Possibly, yeah, and again, I would probably want some more, but I think I probably would, because there's so much in it, and so much that can be, so many perspectives, and, you know, there's so many different things that he's packed into it. Do you still do that thing where you um, discover a writer, and then it's like, oh, they've written ten? Yes, oh god, it's such a thrill, isn't it? Yes, yeah, it's, it's like that thing. moment when, I always think, especially with female friendship, there is a point at which two women fall in love, and in a totally non-sexual way. And it's a bit like that feeling when you meet this mm. woman and you think, God, you're fantastic. I think yeah. you're great. Let's go for a drink. And you know that you're going to be friends for a long time. And that's a really exciting moment. But it's a bit like that when you find somebody and you think, thank God, they've got this amazing back catalogue. Yeah. <laughs> to read. That's what I'm doing. Um, what advice would you give younger women? I think to try and find some acceptance, particularly about your body. You know, I mean, I, you know, when I, I look back at my photos of myself now in my 20s, and I remember being being miserable about it in certain ways and being harsh mm-hmm. on myself. So me, and I th- I'm sure everybody says it. Says that brilliant bit which Nora Ephron says. She, I'm probably paraphrasing her very badly, but she said that she wishes she spent all her twenties wearing a bikini mm. <laughs> because she could, you know. And I think, and it doesn't last. You know, it doesn't last long. You know, time marches along a lot more quickly than you ever think it will. When I think back to how much I've beaten myself up over the years about body image. Yeah, mad, isn't it? Oh so all that wasted God. energy. Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You've been doing anything. Sometimes I look at myself and I do, have, of course, as everybody does, you look in the mirror and you think, oh, God. But then, I don't know, you have to remember that when I'm, hopefully, if I ever, if I reach this age, if I'm 60 or 70, I'm going to look back at photos of myself at 48 and think, what was I so worried about? Yes, yeah. <laughs> You've got to remember that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it still applies. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. It's still, it's an ongoing process. What would your superpower be? I think a superpower I would like, I think, is to be able to look at people and know the best way to help them, I think, if somebody's upset. I think that would be a brilliant superpower to have, wouldn't it? That's a little bit Agnes. (laughs) Perhaps it is. That's the reason why I wrote her like that. Who would your old bird role model be? There's a writer, actually. She's been dead quite a long time, but she's called Isabella Lucy Bird. And she... Oh, I've never heard of her. Oh, she's quite something. As a teenager, she was told that she was very delicate and she needed to kind of basically stay lying on the sofa. 
and she hurt her back and the doctor said no no you really mustn't you must lie down and rest and she didn't she traveled all over all over the world actually all over china and all over i think she went to mongolia and then she had this whole <laughs> book that she wrote all about the rockies and while she was in the rockies she married this kind of wild man who lived out and out. <laughs> she just had this fantastic life and i really love the idea that she got this diagnosis and just thought no I'm not going to do it I'm going to go and travel all over the world at a time when really women really didn't. She sounds amazing. Where She's did you hear very about cool. Her? I read her books years ago. And lastly, how many fucks do you give? <laughs> Mostly zero about a lot of things, but a huge number about other things. I don't have any slogan t-shirts or sweatshirts at all. I, sort of, I don't really like them. I don't really like the idea. I think, you know, your clothes should be by implication rather than literal. But I do have one that says some things are not important. Yeah. <laughs> so I wear it to do my yoga in. Yeah. <laughs> but some things just really aren't. Yeah. <laughs> and you should really give zero fucks about any of those, but save all your fucks for something that really does matter. That's really brilliant. That's a really good place to end. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you so Maggie. Much. Thank, Thank you. you. So much. Thank you for listening. I'd love to hear your feedback. You can reach me on Twitter at Sam Baker and Instagram at the other Sam Baker using the hashtag the shift. You can hear a new episode of The Shift each week on Acast, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. If you like what you hear, please do rate and subscribe, because it really does help other people find us.